Hello everybody, my name is Lieutenant Timothy Mueller of the United States Coast Guard and I'll be the instructor for this lesson, The Center of Gravity. To start off the lesson, let's start with the definition of center of gravity. The definition of center of gravity is the average location of a distribution of mass in space. In upcoming lessons, and everything that we'll talk about when it comes to shift stability, we're going to refer to this point as point G. An example of this is an old-style toy I like to call the balancing bird toy. It was, it was an odd, oddly shaped distribution of mass in the shape of a bird with very strong outstretched wings out front. Even though the center of gravity wasn't where the beak was precisely, the outstretched wings put enough mass forward to move the center of gravity so that when you balanced it on your finger, you could spin it around and it wouldn't fall because the center of gravity was located directly over where your finger was. So now to start off this lesson, let's take a look at the equation that defines what the center of gravity is. Many people are aware with the center of gravity, center of mass of different things in their everyday life, but let's take a look at what the mathematical definition is. So we'll see here, capital R equals 1 over capital M times the summation from I equals 1 to N of lowercase m I lowercase r i. What does all this mean? What are all these variables that I'm saying? Capital R is what we're trying to find. This is the coordinate of G. Capital M is the total mass of the system. Lowercase m is the mass of each individual part, as well as r is the coordinate of each individual part. <clears throat> i is the index. The index is something that's used in conjunction with lowercase m and lowercase r to know exactly which piece of the system we're talking about. If we're talking about M1, R1, as we'll see in this example problem, then our I would be 1 as we step through this summation. <clears throat> what this summation means is that we're going to start here at I equals 1, then we're going to go into the parentheses, and we're going to evaluate that expression inside the parentheses, and then when we're done with that, we're going to add that to the same thing, only we're going to increment the index by 1. So we have I equals 1, we'll do M1, R1, then we're going to add that to m2, r2, then we're going to do it again until we get i equals this top number, n. So if we had three pieces, we would add that m1, r1 to m2, r2 to m3, r3. And if we had more, we would just keep going. <clears throat> and then n, like I said before, is just the total number of parts. So now that we have the equation, let's go through an example problem so we can make sure that everyone understands exactly what this equation means. So that I'm not blocking the equation on this side of the screen, I've rewritten it over here where we go through the steps to find our center of gravity. So in our example problem, we've defined the system as three different masses. We have a coordinate system down here that's in feet, and then we have three masses, each in long tons. Long tons is a very common system of measurement when it comes to naval architecture and ship stability. We have our first mass of two long tons located at one foot. Our second piece of the system, M2, is five long tons, and that's at a coordinate of three feet. As well as at five feet, we have one long ton, which pertains to mass number three. So our step one, if we look at our equation, we know what our MIs and RIs are. Each piece is defined. We don't know what R is, that's what we're trying to solve. We know what n is. n is just the total number of pieces, 1, 2, 3, so n equals 3. So we have to find m, this capital M, total mass of the system. In order to find m, all we have to do is sum up the individual masses to get the total system mass. So you have capital M equals m1 plus m2 plus m3. Just plugging the numbers in, m1 is 2, that goes there. m2 is 5, that goes there. And m3 is 1, and that goes there. See, so 2 is m1, 5 is m2. 1 is M3, add them together, and you get 8 long tons. Now we know everything except for what we're trying to find, capital R. So step 2 is to find R. I've rewritten the equation like I said before. Now I just expanded out the summation, showing each individual index. With this equation, we have the expression for index equals 1 right here, plus the index equals 2 expression here, and then the index equals 3 expression right there at the very end. Now let's plug in everything that we know and try and find R. R equals 1 over capital M, which we've already found out is 8 long tons, times the summation 2 times 1, 2 is M1, R1 is 1 foot, 
then 5 times 3, M2 is 5 long tons, R2 is 3 feet, and then M3, R3, M3 being 1 long ton, and R3 being 5 feet. Now we just take what's in the parentheses, multiply together, multiply each expression, then add them all together and divide by the total mass of the system. So we have R equals 2 plus 15 plus 5, all divided by 8. So here, add them together, get 22 over 8, or in decimal terms, R, the coordinate of the center of gravity, equals 2.75 feet. Now that we've found the coordinate of the center of gravity of our system, let's do a quick check and make sure that all the work that we did is correct. In doing this check, I'm going to introduce the concept of moments to you. A moment is just a force times a distance, and you've seen examples of moments in everyday life trying to get a bolt out of something at your house or on a car. When you have a bolt that's seized, you don't necessarily get a thicker wrench, you always try and get a longer wrench. That's going to impart more of a moment to try and free it from the seizing moments caused by rust or whatever might be holding it back. Moments are something that's critical in calculations for naval architecture and ship stability. <clears throat> now the question that we ask ourselves is, do the moments cancel each other out? We're going to have moments on one side trying to make the system spin counterclockwise, and the other side is going to make, try and make it spin clockwise. Like I said, a moment is just a force times a distance. And I've redrawn our system, but instead of boxes, I just have arrows that represent the force that each mass is imparting on the system. So we have a force of two long tons here, we have five long tons here, and one long ton here, with a pivot point drawn at 2.75, which is what we calculated as our G. So now let's look at the left side. This is everything that's trying to make the system spin counterclockwise along this pivot point. So we know that a moment is just a force times a distance. We have a force of two long tons, but instead of using the R for, for the arrow, we use 1.75. 1.75 being the distance from the force to the pivot. <clears throat> so you have one foot, and then from two to 2.75. So you have two times 1.75, and we have 3.5 foot long tons. Moments are always expressed in units of length times a force. <clears throat> now we go to the right side. We have two moments that are working on the system on this side, so now we have to add the two moments together. So restating a moment is the force times the distance. We're going to look at the moment caused by mass number two, which is five long tons, the force doesn't change, times 0 0.25 feet, which is the distance from 2.75 feet to three feet, which is where the five long tons is acting. And we're going to add that to the moment caused by mass number three. Mass number three was one long ton, or it was imparting a one long ton force on the system. And its distance from the pivot point is 2.25. From 2.75, you add a quarter to get to three, add one, add another one, 2.25. So we have five times one quarter plus one times two and a quarter. We get one and a quarter plus two and a quarter equals three and a half. So we see that the moments on the left side, three and a half foot long tons, equals the moments on the right side, which is three and a half foot long tons. So our calculation that we did in the previous example problem was correct. To conclude this lesson, I'm going to go over a quick motivation as to why you should worry about the ship's center of gravity while you're on board. The ship's center of gravity is something that's critical in making naval architecture and ship stability calculations, just like moments that I mentioned before. So here we have two examples of a ship that's underway. In this one, we have a ship with a center of gravity G naught and an initial water line, water line naught. This symbol here stands for the center line of the ship and it just runs from the keel all the way to the very top and it is currently underway with two empty fuel tanks. Now it takes on fuel and we fill those two fuel tanks. Since we've added weight down low, our pivot point, our center of gravity, is going to follow that weight addition, so it's going to get a little bit lower. We know that we're adding weight as well, and so the ship is going to become a little bit heavier, and so the water line, by in intuition, is going to rise a little bit. So now we have a center of gravity a little bit lower than it was originally. This is G1. Now say we take uneven suction from these tanks. Now we have a shift in the center of gravity towards the heavier side, so on our port side, we lose our fuel, our weight, 
And on the starboard side, we maintain that weight and all that fuel. So we have a shift to starboard. We also have a shift up because we're removing low weight. And so the center of gravity, that pivot point is going to drift ever so slightly higher. In the second example, we have a ship that's underway and it takes on a helicopter on one of its flight decks. We have an initial center of gravity, G naught, and an initial waterline, waterline naught. We add weight high, so we're gonna have a center of gravity shifting higher, as well as we've added weight, so we're gonna have the, the ship sink deeper into the water, which means the water level is gonna rise. Now, if we shift that helicopter over to one side of the flight deck, the center of gravity is gonna follow that shift. So we have G1, which is here, which followed from the addition of the helicopter, it's gonna shift over to G2. And how much or how far it shifts is gonna depend on the moments that occur from the helicopter and from the ship itself. I hope you enjoyed this lesson and I'll see you on the next installment of chapter zero, where I'll go over the center of buoyancy of a submerged object.